Okay, so health and safety and um, the title page is actually the main document that was published for the introduction of Health and Safety and Work Act 2015. So it's a fairly new law that came into a place and it's been in force since uh, 2016. And this new Health, Safety and Work Act was actually prompted by the mining disaster we had on the West Coast when we realized um, that there was a number of shortcomings in the way that safety is managed uh, here in New Zealand in the workplace. And also it actually recognized that New Zealand as a country across all industries, we actually don't do very well. We have an above average number of accidents in our workplaces compared to other Western nations, okay? So this is really a move to try and step us up to reduce the number of accidents and incidents that we have across all of New Zealand. But forestry is very much uh, a, a very big part of this deliberation because forestry as an industry had an above average number of accidents uh, associated with our industry, hence the importance of it. So you'll see this lecture I've uh, referenced there, Hunter Harrell, and I'd just like to acknowledge that he's helped uh, put a lot of this material together for us here. So what really is this uh, Health, Safety and Work Act, so shortened to HW, HSWA, and, and it is nice in, in that it's very similar to the Resource Management Act in the environment. This, this act is very much about trying to get a balance, okay? So it specifically references a balanced framework. So it's not an absolute, it's not like you must do this, you must do that. They're trying to provide a balance to secure the health and safety of workers and workplaces. Okay, so when it talks about securing health and safety, it also talks about securing work and workplaces as well. We've got to be somewhat reasonable and balanced in how we apply this, because otherwise we wouldn't have many workplaces available to us. There are some very specific elements within this law, and again, they line up really quite nicely with the environmental law as well, especially this first one. So in an ideal world, we would eliminate all of our risks from work, okay? But there's a strong recognition that while there are certain elements we can eliminate, we certainly can't eliminate all the risks, especially for a very dynamic activity such as timber harvesting. So what we're typically trying to do is really minimize those risks, especially what they perceive to be the critical risks. So this is something I would like you to know is critical risks and critical risks are those that can lead to very serious harm accidents or fatalities, okay? So you're very much responsible for critical risks and critical risks are those ones that can really, really hurt people, okay? That's important. The other thing that this law allows for is fair and effective workplace representation. So again, that's one of those learnings from that Pike River uh, incident where a lot of workers were concerned about what was going on, but that concern wasn't being listened to by management. And so this law now makes sure that if you have a larger workplace, the workers are able to effectively get those safety messages up through into management and have a consultation and a resolution of those issues. Okay. The other thing is, again, sometimes health and safety, it just feels um, like it's a, a very serious issue, but what we need to be is simply constructive in promoting improvement. So if you are um, working in a workplace, as long as you're being constructive and helpful and trying to improve, you are doing your job. There's no absolutes here. You are simply asked to engage with the process, okay? And that's that next point is promoting advice, information, and education. Many of you will take on a management or a leadership type role uh, in an industry, be it forestry or another industry. Um, so your job really is to make sure that the good information that we have actually gets out to those frontline workers that are often most at risk, okay? And then finally is providing that framework. What does that look like? What are we doing? How are we doing it for continuous improvement, okay? 
as part of this class, and I know some of you also found some videos, if you look at our harvesting forestry practices from 60 years ago or 80 years ago, you know, it just comes up as a bit of a shock. You go, what were they doing? You know, this is, uh, it's very different. But also remember that in 60 or 80 years time, people are gonna be looking at us and will be saying, what are they doing? And the only reason they would have gotten to that point is because of that continuous improvement, continuous engagement in trying to improve our standards. So in terms of some of those details in the Act that I think are important and I'm sharing with you now, is that the Act actually defines specific people as well as the duties that they have, okay? So it covers all issues in workplaces and work activity, but there are certain terms, in this case people, that I'd like you to be aware of. So they're principles, PCBUs, officers and workers. So they are specific um, entities, people referenced within the law um, that have very specific responsibilities. Okay. I'll just step through them one by one. So the principle, okay, so the principle you can see in this document that's made available uh, by WorkSafe is usually the forest owner, okay, but many of our forests are owned by an investment entity, in which case it's their representative. So that would be the CEO, okay? So the person charge of the representative of the owners, okay? Now, if you're in a smaller company, the representative could also be a crew supervisor. For example, if somebody's invested in a logging crew, but they're not active in it, then the supervisor becomes the principal. They are the main person responsible for that logging crew, okay? Now, the nice thing is once you can identify this person, they have specific tasks associated with them. For example, if you ever become a principal, you need to make sure that there is a documented safety system and you need to make sure that it's audited, okay? You don't need to write it yourself. You don't need to audit it yourself, but you're responsible for making sure there is one and that it is being audited, okay? The other thing is you are responsible for making sure that there are safety meetings, especially with those health and safety managers and trainers that you may with, have within your organization. Again, you might not need to do this yourself. You just need to make sure that they are occurring. Okay. And the other thing is work with your employees and contractors to identify and control hazards. Legal requirement that if there are hazards out there, that they are being identified and that information is being shared between the different layers effectively of our workforce. PCBU, so that is a term I would like you to know. So it stands for a person conducting a business or undertaking. So the government or the lawyers have come up with this new term because when you talk about employers or supervisors or employees, it's an easy way out because somebody can say, well, technically I'm not an employee or technically I'm not an employer, okay? So what this PCBU does, this term, it basically references all of us. So anybody who's involved in the business or undertaking, okay, anybody who's involved becomes a PCBU, okay? So but what typically, um, uh, a really nice example is a contractor, okay, contractor working for a bigger company uh, or any contractor that's on site, somebody delivering fuel, somebody fixing hoses, they become a PCBU, okay? So some of the things a PCBU must do is train and supervise, okay? Identify and assess the hazards, okay? Maintain equipment, so now we're getting far more practical. We're talking about maintaining equipment and machinery. So you can see the principal's not really responsible for that. It's the PCBU that's responsible for that, okay? Making sure my crew's getting rest, meal breaks, and have the right personal protective equipment. So PPE, personal protective equipment, all right? So these are these roles of a PCBU within the Health, Safety, and Work Act. There are more detailed instructions and I've listed them here. So 
that booklet with these images, nice and simple, you know, clear text. And again, this is a resource that if you were a forest manager, you could take this resource out to your crew to help them explain what are those, what are those terms mean and what are some of those main tasks. But also remember that in the background, the law itself has more detail, okay? So PCBU, maintaining work environment that's without risks to health and safety, okay? And when it says without risks, remember again, I'm talking about those critical risks. And it's aligned with that forest industry mantra that nobody should be going to work and risk not being able to go home in the evening, okay? So that's that critical risk. Everybody goes to work, might get hurt, might pick up a bruise, might pick up a sprained ankle, but we're trying to minimize those, but everybody should be able to go home at the end of the day, okay, just as they arrive. So that's critical. Okay, so here's some more specifics. Ensuring a safe use, handling and storage. Adequate facilities for the welfare of the worker. So again, this is more details to the, the, the basic overview that was provided before. The last point though is of interest, monitoring the health of your workers. So if you are a PCBU, for example, a foreman um, of a crew, you are actually expected to take an interest in and actually monitor the health of your workers. So the health and well-being of your workers, which is physical, but also mental. And I'll give you an example a little bit later on. Okay. Officers. Okay, again, a specific term within the Health, Safety and Work Act. And what we see here um, to the right of this lady is that organizations with more than 30 workers must have a health and safety rep. Okay, so organizations with less than 30 workers can have one, but organizations with more must have one. Okay, and this is effectively a person who's been um, voted in, elected by the workers to represent them for health and safety. So it kind of recognizes that a lot of our workers might not feel comfortable approaching management with a concern. So the idea is that they can approach their health and safety rep and the health and safety rep goes, somebody has identified this as a problem. So it never gets back to that person. You've got that uh, degree of separation, but it makes sure that concerns are being uh, put through to management and the people who can actually do something about it. Okay, so now if you become the elected safety rep in your organization at the School of Forestry, it's David Norton. So I think some of you have had David Norton in lectures. He's our health and safety rep. Okay, so what does he have to do as an officer? He has to hold regular safety meetings. So he has to talk to us about safety and hazards the, through these regular meetings and we meet every month. For example, at the School of Forestry, you may have a different, um, or each entity may have a different uh, uh, frequency of these meetings, okay? Make sure everybody knows where the safety equipment is and how to use it, okay? So we all do, uh, where are the fire extinguishers, where are the fire exits, um, where is the health and safety kits, and of course, this document was specifically put together for forestry harvesting, manage harvesting safe areas. So on all logging sites, there should be a safe area where a forest worker can go and they know that they're safe in that space. There's no logging operation that can occur within that space, okay? Again, that's a very specific requirement for harvesting. Now the workers, and again, this has been introduced as well. Um, so you can say, well, I'm just the employee. I just get paid to do um, you know, what I'm told, but actually they have a legal responsibility as well, which means that the safety procedures that are put in place as a forest worker, so many of you might take up a job over summer, okay, you might then be qualified as a worker, you are still legally required to follow those safety procedures, okay? If you do not follow the safety procedures, you're the one that's liable, not your boss, okay? So not your foreman, not the boss, you are the one, okay? They're responsible for putting it in place, you're responsible for following it. 
Guess what's also a legal requirement is that if you see a hazard or if there is an incident, you are legally required to report it. Okay, so that's a requirement. Got to wear your right gear. Okay, and also take steps to keep your workmates safe. Okay, so there's that responsibility for each other as well. Okay. All practicable steps, and again, this is where this balanced, being reasonable, it's practicable. You can't do everything all the time. You've still got to do your work. You've still got to get through it. So it is talking about being practicable and reasonable in terms of how we apply all of these rules and procedures that we put in place, okay? Other people um, just managed to find this photo of myself this morning leading a student field trip. Um, but guess what? So when you go out into the forest, or when I take you out on a field trip into the forest, you're not being paid. So how does that, where does that place you in terms of the Health, Safety and Work Act? Well, the Health, Safety and Work Act specifically references other people's volunteers, on-the-job trainees, or student field trips, okay? So in this case, I become a PCBU because I'm employed and I am paid for example, to take you out on field trips, which means that while you're enjoying the field trip, I'm also responsible for all of your safety, okay? I become a PCBU, but, and so I have responsibilities for you, uh, which is why sometimes I take my field trips seriously, especially the safety, because that's my obligation. You will have a similar obligation if you are taking people, maybe the community out into the forest, you become responsible for their safety. Now, the other thing that the law recognizes is that this is a two-way street. It's easy for the government to make a law and say, everybody do this, but our forestry law specifically requires our regulators, in this case, WorkSafe, they're the ones enforcing the law, but they need to engage with us as well. So it isn't just the one-way street. They have a responsibility to us to engage with us and to educate us, okay? So that's their responsibility. They can't just say this is the law. They must monitor and enforce compliance through inspections. They must also collect and analyze information. So that is why if you wish to have some information about how we're performing, they must make that information available. They must be doing that, okay? Provide advice, okay? And again, in your fourth year course, we will actually step through a lot of those detailed advice documents that they make available uh, for us, okay? And the other thing is they need to actually foster a cooperative. So this is, uh, they can't just be the policeman, they've actually got to be working with us and consult with us to make sure that as a nation, we are moving forward in terms of safety. Here's just a chart, an example of a, um, WorkSafe document. So here you can see the number of fatalities by year split out by industry, okay, by 100,000 employees. So we can see on average manufacturing out of 100,000 employees, about four or five will die in the workplace every year, okay? So very much less than, sorry, that's five, two or three. I apologize, that's just two or three. Okay, it's been staying stagnant, it's, but it's very low, okay? Construction as well. So on the one hand, we see construction, see people climbing up scaffolding, you know, working with big equipment, but have a look. In terms of the death rate per 100,000 employees, that's sitting at about five per year, okay? For every 100,000. Agriculture, we can go, wow, agriculture, farming, they're not doing so well, that's 15, but look at us, you know, forestry. So we cannot blame WorkSafe for targeting us in terms of improving our practices. So if there's one industry or if there's two industries that WorkSafe will target is forestry and fishing. Because we have the worst record and under the law, they are responsible for engaging with uh, the, 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 the worst performers, effectively, which continues to be us, 
okay? So hence, we need to take this really seriously. We want to get this down to agriculture, preferably construction. We don't want to be up there, okay? Forestry should not have to be such a high risk activity that we are very much on the wrong side of these fatality statistics in New Zealand. What they also do is, of course, um, provide more detail um, with that. Uh, some of this detail, because the government has these generic categories. So if somebody's got their microphone on, uh, Max, sorry, did you have a question, Max, or is it, um, otherwise I've just muted you. Let me know if you have a question, that's no problem. Um, but otherwise there's background noise. So the, the government has these <coughs> basic categories. So you can see that by far the majority, so this is in forestry, by far the majority of our accidents hit by moving objects. That's not really so useful. That could be a vehicle, that could be a log, could be another person who knows what that is okay so but obviously moving stuff as you can imagine in a logging operation that's the biggest risk hit by falling objects is also one of those critical risks anything in forestry that comes from above tends to be quite heavy okay and then we've got our falls trips and slips at least it gives us some indication of what the main risks are and of course machinery moving logs moving they are the biggest risk for us uh, in our operations as provided for by the statistics, okay? Accidents, hopefully you can all um, see, just give yourself a second and what's wrong with this picture? <laughs> so this is a picture of somebody working, what's wrong with that picture? Hopefully already you will pick up on a number of obvious concerns. One is no hard hat. Another one is no hearing protection. Another one is no hivers. Okay. Another one is working with a chainsaw, no chaps. Okay. But there's actually also some specific guidance that you may not be familiar with. It's always bad practice to operate a chainsaw above shoulder height. Once you start lifting a chainsaw above shoulder height and you start trying to cut things above shoulder height, it is an extremely dangerous activity, okay? You get all sorts of kickback. You simply can't control that chainsaw very well. Now, if you're squeamish, just look away for a second. Um, but I will just show you some of those consequences of, and this person was very, very lucky, they were just nicked by a chainsaw, okay, but just being touched by a chainsaw will do this level of damage. If it hits a bit harder, it will simply kill you, okay? So chainsaws, other uh, machines are very, very risky to operate. That picture is gone, so if you were squeamish and you've looked away, you can come back now. Um, even though this picture isn't really a lot better, but this is an accident from the central North Island. And you can wonder why this car ended up being skewered um, by these logs. You can see that the logs were painted, but this is an accident that happened early morning. It was a little bit foggy. The vehicle uh, was traveling fast, probably too fast. Okay, but what happened was that this logging truck was actually turning a corner. So the crew may, the, the driver of the vehicle may have thought, oh, they're turning off, I can overtake them. But obviously they didn't realize that these logs were sticking out so far behind the truck that when the truck went to turn, these logs actually swung out into the overtaking lane and they ended up um, skewering that log. Okay, so these accidents, these are sort of critical risk accidents that we really need to uh, try to manage. That's why companies now are so critical of what type of vehicles have access to the forests and making sure that they're the appropriate vehicle um, and that they have safety protocols in place, such as being aware if you've got an off-road truck that's got over length timber, 
making sure that the drivers are aware that when they turn, these logs will swing out onto the road. It's the wrong time to try and overtake them. Accidents versus accidents, what's the difference? Okay, injuries are not accidents, but are the result of an accident, okay? So you can have an accident where nobody's hurt, okay? But normally if there's an injury, there's been an accident, okay? The other thing is, if you get into detail, an accident is typically a link in a chain of events. Accidents don't just happen, they typically happen because of something, okay? Typically, there's something in the background going on. In normal circumstances, people don't get injured, okay? So something's happening in the background that is causing the potential for this accident to happen, okay? Now, it can be such a thing as a personal defect, and this can be the person or it can be the equipment. Something's gone wrong to allow this accident to actually occur, uh, and it's typically a person interacting so it's the person themselves or the equipment that leads to an unsafe condition or an act. So somebody's done something for some reason that isn't safe, okay? They didn't need to do it, okay? Or something has become unsafe, for example, a piece of equipment, uh, and it's become an unsafe condition. That's when that accident occurs, all right? And I'll give you some examples of that, and that's when an accident occurs you might get lucky and fall off something and not be hurt, or you might get unlucky and fall off something and fall onto something and get quite a serious injury, okay? But before these accidents happen, really important for you to understand that within a workplace, because of our focus on health and safety, something must have been unsafe, either a person or a piece of equipment or an activity, and typically, that was made unsafe because somebody didn't do the right thing and somebody didn't do the right thing because of some sort of a background issue, okay? So often to avoid injuries, we need to get back and understand what's happening in the background so that we don't get people injured, okay? Here's an example um, that Hunter um, pulled up. So a foreman, on a cable logging crew is having marital problems, okay? You might straight away step back and go, what does this have to do with me? You know, somebody's got boyfriend, girlfriend problems, marital problems, what's this got to do with me? But the thing is, this person is at your workplace and they've turned up to work and they're distracted and emotionally upset. So hopefully now that's, that should be sending off some flags. That's the background, okay? Nothing's happened yet, but this person is distracted and upset. So they go around their regular job, which includes setting out a straw line for a line shift. Okay, that's that small cable you pull out in a cable logging operation. Okay. Because they're distracted, they fail to notice that a turn of logs is being started, okay? And so when you start pulling on logs, you've done your cable logging rigging now, the haulback line is going to jump up, right? When you pull on your main line, your haulback line is going to come under tension. In laying out the straw line, he's got to go across that straw, that haulback line. So just as he steps over, the yarder operator is pulling on the rope. There's no reason for a yarder operator to be aware that that person is out there. Okay, that person should have let them known. But if you step over a rope and tension comes onto the rope, you're lucky not to die. In this case, they broke their back and they had concussion. Okay, so now that's the injury. That's the very serious accident harm injury. But this is the background, right? So if somebody's really upset, should they be taking, undertaking an activity like pulling straw line all the way across a site on an active logging operation, that's something that we had a personal defect that was unsafe and it resulted in an accident, okay? So the marital problems is the background. They're distracted and emotionally upset, okay? They're stepping over a back line, which they shouldn't be doing, okay? Accident is worker thrown in the air and the injury is the concussion and the broken back, okay? But it all started off right here. 
So in terms of rates of accident, um, what we what's important is this triangle, all right? So near misses are things that might occur, I'd like to think not very often, but if they are occurring often, we should know that near misses leads to damage in about one out of 20, always depends on how you measure it, might lead to property damage and near miss, something broke because something fell, okay? But then one in 60 actually leads to an injury, okay? So you can have lots of near miss accidents but only one in 60 will actually cause an injury. But one of those 10 injuries will be very serious, okay? So now if we can reduce the number of near miss accidents, you can say, well, it's a near miss, it doesn't matter because yes, it does, because we have enough of them, somebody's gonna get seriously hurt. That's why in a practicable sense, and also as that engagement, if you can manage your near misses, you will reduce your serious injuries, okay? Incident reporting, there's actually, so you have that legal requirement around reporting to the government for serious harm injuries, but the forest owners has a really nice system in place that you will become familiar with if you work in our forest industry, where any company that has a near miss or an injury or an accident is encouraged to report it, okay? and load up a PDF. So they're typically one or one or two page incident reports about what happened and then what the outcome was. So you can see here, Blakely Pacific has put one in, driving on the road, so it was a driving. Pampax put one in, a hang up with a leg fracture, doing silviculture, arbor forestry, sudden rope movement in harvesting. So these are these things that are loaded up and you can search that database and it's almost any topic you can think of, it would have occurred previously, and that's where we can learn from those accidents. Okay. Just in terms of some of those examples, um, uh, hunters pulled these together, so a log truck comes off the road, driver could have lost control, so the owner goes and buys a new transmission to make sure that that log truck can get into that low gear and slow down on those long, uh, favorable grades coming down the slope. Okay, they've undertaken something that will prevent it, but uh, here's another example, loader operator, too close to the deck, swings and it hits the machine, it does damage to the machine, operator wasn't injured, and the only simply repairs the body of the machine. Timber faller, cuts off a corner, tree comes off, okay, smashes a saw, what does the owner do? Buys a new chainsaw, okay? But in all of these examples, they're all near miss. Nobody got hurt. The reaction was to simply replace the object. But what we really need to do is look at what's causing these incidents because if it happens again, it might not be the chainsaw, might be the person that gets smashed, okay? So that's the important lessons we need to learn from incidents, okay? All near misses resulted in property damage. All had the potential to be fatal, okay? So these are serious incidents that we need to work with to try and prevent in the future. Here's one, um, hopefully you can see this picture. Just have a good look and see if you can see what happened. Right. Truck, so what do the truck drivers do? They need to throw a chain across the logs to secure it. Look what happened to the chain. So they threw the chain up and it went over the power line, okay? So it went over the power line, got your voltage coming through the truck and it incinerated the truck, okay? So the, the, the person I believe got a shock and was bounced back, they were okay, uh, but obviously the truck is not, okay? So, but again, is this obvious? Again, truck drivers often, you kind of forget just how far that chain might go if you're throwing it up and over, it's a longer chain, so just if you're not experienced or you didn't really think it through, you can make these mistakes. But we also hope in the future that nobody else makes that mistake. I've actually just put this example in because you're doing a harvest planning assignment. Why is it so important for you to be measuring slope and choosing better, for example, cable logging systems to work on slopes? When we have machines working on slopes, 
and they start to roll down the hill if it's too steep. This is all that's left. So this is a skitter that's rolled down the hill. You can see that there's not much left of the skitter. The wheels have gone, it's been smashed to pieces. And you can imagine the operator wouldn't have fared very well either. So this is, if you're in that harvest planning, becomes your responsibility to choose the right system for, in this case, the right conditions, mainly being the slope. So accident prevention is all about people. Mention that people still are the biggest cause of accidents, okay, the decisions that they make. But there's often economic factors, employee morale, as well as some of those public relations. It's also how the public perceive us. These are all reasons for having really good accident prevention type programs. Just wanna show you another example. So, and this is looking specifically at the economics. So here we've got a cable yarder, okay? And there's typically a person here, standing here, they work here, they're called the poleman, and they are unhooking the logs as they come up to the landing, okay? So there's a person there. So an accident resulted of uh, guidelines that were not strong enough, okay? And by the guidelines breaking, the tower flicked over forward. And fortunately, the uh, person who was standing here was only hurt, but not seriously harmed. The person who was operating the yarder, they're inside this protected cab. So they would have got a shock, but they weren't hurt uh, in that protective cab. But if we just have a look at those costs, which is why costs can be very deceptive. So this person who was hurt went to see the doctor. Took him a couple of hours to go and see a doctor. So you've got a lost time cost. You've got a medical cost. They had to bring somebody else in to replace him for a while. They had to bring a new polman in. So you can say the cost of the actual injury was only about $500, the direct costs. But the cost to the equipment, by the time you get the tower back up and fix the tower, $15,000, $500 to the yarder. So a total of $15,000 in equipment. So this is really just to highlight that accidents isn't just a cost to people, it is, and it's more than just the dollars, but it's also a big cost to the operation. So if we can avoid accidents, we're not only looking after our people, but we're also looking after the economics, okay? So that's a really big part of safety as well, okay? This is the main, point that will be made safe crews are more productive crews. So even if you take a little bit longer for your normal tasks to be safer, in the long run you'll be more productive because you'll have less downtime associated with your accidents or incidents. Okay. Hey, just a little bit more detail um, around some of those injuries that can occur. So this is from about 20 years ago. Look at these injuries, head, hand, and left leg. Left leg, left leg, hand, and left side of the head. This is related to a chainsaw, okay? So most people are right-handed, or even left-handed people will use most chainsaws right-handed, okay? So if you're right-handed, the chainsaw is on your left-hand side. So that's the hand or the arm that gets injured. Okay. We've always had these injuries with chainsaw use, hence the big move towards mechanization. Okay. So we have information, we have data. Is a chainsaw a good tool? Yes, it is. Is there risks associated with using chainsaws? Yes, there are. And so some of the rules that came in, for example, in New Zealand, you must wear a mitt. So there must be an attached mitt to the chainsaw. That stops your hand from sliding off and you hurting your hand. And also you must wear chaps that prevent your leg from getting injured. And you must wear steel capped, preferably Kevlar boots. And that stops your foot from getting injured. So by knowing the frequency of injuries and the, and the uh, specific risk parts of your body in this case, we can actually act on that and have specific safety equipment and or practices in place to eliminate or minimize these risks. Okay, so fatalities, and this just ties in with some of those risks that we've mentioned previously in class. So motor manual fouling, 
So this gentleman here is simulating what occurred. You can actually see, you've learned that right there, cutting in the scarf. So they've made the top cut of the scarf. So this person's just simulating. So this was a fatality. So they were cutting in and guess what? That branch, which we call a widow maker in terms of terminology, can also be called a sailor, but it's basically any object that's up in the crown that can come down. Okay, and that branch came down and hit that worker on the head and it killed him. Okay, so that's what happened. So they were looking down, they were cutting, and perhaps you never know afterwards, but perhaps they didn't look up, they didn't see the risk, or if they did see the risk, they underestimated that risk. Okay. So here you can unfortunately still see the, the blood, but this is the log that came down. So you can see that when something like this comes down, it's it's really risky. It's it's gonna create a serious injury or a fatality. That's why this is such a risky activity. Okay. In the end, it's an accident investigation. And one of the frustrating things for the accident investigators is this loader was nearby, actually doing some other work. So if that chainsaw faller had seen that risk, it would have only taken about 10 minutes for this excavator to have come and walked across and actually pulled that tree over, as opposed to trying to cut it down with a risk. Okay, so that's that, um, you know, 10 extra minutes, maybe they were in a hurry, maybe they didn't see it, but in 10 minutes they could have done it safely and we wouldn't have had this accident. That really obviously was a tragedy, both as at a personal level, but also for the company. Okay, so be safe out there. Um, I think that's my last message. You do need to be reasonable and balanced. So I, I guess I've been fortunate to work in areas like in Fiji um, and also in South America. This is actually a photo from Europe as well. So here you see a, a, a young man operating with a chainsaw, slightly older photo but you can see no PPE. So it is one of those things where you say, well, what about a hard hat? Hearing protection was certainly important, but in terms of them wearing a lot of clothes in a, in a tropical environment, just remember to be reasonable and balanced because you can get a lot of fatigue uh, and or type those problems. I mean, the idea here is to go mechanize them, put them into a climate controlled cab, uh, but otherwise, uh, it, it's easy to say, oh, you should put all your clothes on, but if you were to operate a chainsaw with all of our standard safety clothes on, you wouldn't be working for very long at all, okay? This picture here, technically it's also a very illegal uh, Central European country. Uh, we took this photo only a couple of years ago. Um, you see a couple of the forest workers coming up on a cable logging. So what, that's the carriage, right? These are your chokers. They've simply attached a small log to the two chokers and they've jumped up on it and they've ridden that carriage up the hill. Uh, in the morning, they would have probably ridden it down the hill. Again, it's really easy to be critical. In New Zealand, this is just an absolute no-no. Okay, you, it's illegal to do this. But also when you talk to them, it was, well, yes, we are. It's obvious. We know we're not supposed to do it. But the alternative is to walk 500 meters uphill with our saws, with our fuel, with all of our safety equipment. And so on very steep slopes, we run the risk of slips and trips. And if we ride the carriage up, there's a much lower chance of something happening. But of course, if something did happen, it would be quite dramatic. So again, it's very difficult for me to criticize this because being reasonable and balanced is part of safety. It's not allowed in New Zealand, I would defend that, but in certain parts of the world, I can see that the alternatives are not much better. So, so it is that opportunity to be reasonable and balanced in our um, application. Quite a long lecture, lots of information, health and safety, but hopefully it was at least, make sure you're aware, health and safety law, that there are specific elements in it, including specific people. These people have specific responsibilities, but the main thing is to be proactive. And the nice thing about being proactive is really in that teaching, education, training. If something happens, make sure people know about it, make sure we learn from it. 
okay? And just be very positive about the way that we engage in safety. And that's the main um, uh, task that we have uh, of being in charge of safety, okay? Can't be absolute.